Good morning. Oh, is it afternoon already? Good afternoon. Good morning. Bonjour. Ça me fait vraiment un grand plaisir d'être ici avec vous aujourd'hui. It's really such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you uh, to uh, Larry for the invitation to begin with, everyone at the Prostate Cancer Canada Network. Uh, it's not often, in fact, probably never have I been able to spend a Saturday morning with essentially a room full of very uh, gracious gentlemen and a few ladies thrown in there. So um, uh, uh, it's just been a pleasure. Thank you. And no lineup at the ladies' washroom. This is great. <laughs> Shall I wait till you take a picture and get it done? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so full disclosure right off the top, I am here representing the Association of the Innovative Pharmaceutical Industry. And it's somewhat ironic, I, I think all the physicians have left the room, haven't they? <laughs> There's some tensions in the environment these days. I'm sure they had many, many things to do. And I must admit, I'm feeling a bit daunted coming on and speaking with you after such a panel that we've had. Wasn't that tremendous? Every day I learned something, but this was just amazing. So kudos to the organizers, to Jennifer and, and all those involved in, in pulling together this great panel. So um, I am representing that industry, industry, but as mentioned, I come from the health sector background. And I'm as aware as I can be of some of the tensions that can exist between the private sector and a public good, in this case health. And specifically, the current tensions around the price of pharmaceuticals it came up today already. However, I'm not here to talk about that. I am committed to the idea and the ideal that the best solutions come from collaboration, from constructive dialogue, healthy challenges, and compromise. This is going to be the foundation and mainstay of my comments today and beyond. It is the vision of my association and industry to be the best partner possible to contribute to creative solutions and to share the weight of some of our most challenging concerns. In my words, I label it hope and inspiration. And as you've heard in the few words of introduction and now, I'm just really a few months into this new world of the pharmaceutical industry. And I have to say it has been enlightening, it's been exciting, and uh, I'm going to share with you some of my learnings uh, over the last few months, and hopefully it will be of interest. Uh, I often do say to audiences that my job is to, to speak for a few minutes, yours is to listen. If you finish your job before me, please let me know. So here's just a bit of an outline of the, some of the things that I'd like to address. Uh, we'll do it all in hopefully around 20, 25 minutes. Uh, I know there's 45 minutes on the agenda, but I don't plan on taking up all of that time. Uh, I hope to have some questions and hope even more to be able to answer them. So we're going to look a little bit about what the heck is IMC. I'm not supposed to say that, by the way. We've rebranded. We used to be RXND. It's Innovative Medicines Canada. Uh, take a look at the economic footprint. So what is the value of this industry to all of us? As I mentioned a moment ago, sometimes the dialogue in media and externally gets focused on the price. That dialogue has to happen, but beyond that, there's value. And the, the whole process from, um, from what we call bench to, to bed, getting drugs from that twinkle in a scientist's eye to where it will help all of us. Talk a bit about the economics, that urgency of access, what it takes to get a drug through, uh, again, a, another aspect of it. And then uh, finally, I'll, I'll finish up in terms of the, the power of, of uh, partnerships. So I think I'm supposed to click now. Ah, there we go. Uh, that is Innovative Medicines Canada. Our job is to discover and develop new medicines and vaccines to improve the health of Canadians, all of us. For decades, Canadians have benefited from these discoveries. Innovative medicines and vaccines have eradicated diseases like polio and smallpox. And in just one generation, we've shifted HIV from a death sentence to a manageable chronic illness and research continues to focus on finding an actual cure. We now have, effectively, a cure for hepatitis C. Who would have thought that? We're saving and enhancing the lives of many Canadians. But the challenges that we're all facing are daunting. I think we're all familiar with the many issues which Canada and other developed economies are dealing with. Aging populations, the rise of expensive orphan drugs, as they call them, and specialized treatments for very rare diseases, 
heightened patient expectations around fast and fair access, and of course, cost-constrained government budgets. And again, we heard that just in the last panel, talking about robotics and when will be they be available to all. The challenge is, at the same time that we're grappling with all these issues, the ability to save lives, to extend lifetimes, to enhance the quality of life for all Canadians has never been greater. Increasingly sophisticated data analytics allow us to collect and analyze vast amounts of patient information, while breakthroughs in genomics are leading to personalized medicines, groundbreaking cures that may one day even tackle debilitating diseases like prostate cancer. This confluence of data analytics and life science is revolutionizing how we look at and treat disease and our assumptions about what is possible. The only way we're going to realize this potential, though, is through collaboration. Healthcare, as we know, is incredibly complex with many stakeholders. Patients, first and foremost. I think, by the way, does anyone know what that is? Do you recognize it? That's, I think that's the Mars building in downtown Toronto, that corridor where all the research is taking place. I'll speak later to the fact that's not where all research takes place, but it is where there's a massive amount of collaboration going on that's producing a lot of the discoveries that we're, we're benefiting from today. Uh, getting back to the stakeholders, and I always name patients first and foremost, is what drives me in all the jobs that I've done, and you've heard a few of them listed. It is what's best for us, for me, for my family, for my neighbors, my friends, for all of you in this room. We say that a lot. Sometimes we pay lip service to it, to be quite frank. Um, but there are most of us out there who truly believe that. And it's why gatherings such as this are, are so inspirational uh, to uh, those who work in the system itself. Of course, healthcare providers are our partners, hospitals, researchers, governments, private insurers, employers, and of course, the industry that I'm now representing it. None of us can do it alone and we truly are all in this together. No, I think something's supposed to happen there. So, at Innovative Medicines Canada, we're all proud to have contributed to the issue that deeply concerns us in this room today. For example, one of our companies, our member companies, Astellas, made a $450,000 investment in uh, this past year in 2016 out in Vancouver to further Canadian investigators' peer-reviewed research that promotes excellence in prostate cancer research, obviously with the ultimate goal, goal of improving patient care. In 2012, Janssen made a $1.2 million investment in a research grant to the Vancouver Prostate Centre and the British Columbia Cancer Agency to study circulating tumor cells as biomarkers in the progress of prostate cancer. The funds provided will help establish the BCCA as a Canadian Centre of Excellence in Prostate Cancer Research. Today what I'd like to do is reflect a bit on some aspects of how new therapies are discovered, approved, evaluated, and hopefully eventually adopted in Canada. As I mentioned earlier, earlier it's a whole new world of discovery for me and I'm still learning. As part of these reflections, I'd like to emphasize how the industry, together with government and stakeholders like the Prostate Cancer Network, can leverage our collective resources to improve timely, equitable, and affordable access to prescription medicines. So here's a snapshot. Let me see if this works. Yes. In oh my goodness. In 2016, it is an important thing to say. Thank you for that. In 2016, more than 38 new medicines were approved by Health Canada. At present, there are more than 7,000 new products in development in the world, including over 1,800 oncology products. 500 of these products are in development right here in Canada. Ontario is a top-ranked centre for cancer and stem cell research. Quebec has renowned centres for neuro neuroscience and cardiovascular investigation. BC, and I've mentioned it already, but it's known for cutting-edge research in the expanding area of genomics. Saskatchewan and Alberta excel in virology. Manitoba is an international star in infectious disease and public health research. And Atlantic Canada has exceptional facilities for vaccine research. And I'm just realizing I didn't answer uh, the earlier question. I hail from Nova Scotia, in case there's anyone in here. 
But all of this to say, this is not just a big city, uh, downtown Toronto, Montreal business. Uh, what is happening in Canada, and what I find so exciting, is happening right across the country. Canada is at the forefront. We really are at the beginning of this golden age of scientific and technological discovery. It's revolutionizing healthcare delivery. The discoveries have the potential not just to improve treatment, but as I've mentioned and made reference to, eradicate complete diseases. Personalized therapies provide hope that the health of Canadians will continue to improve. Scientists are developing new treatments that may help people stop smoking, improve pain management, delay the onset of dementia, lose weight, better treat rheumatoid arthritis, and vastly improve treatments for mental illness. There are exciting opportunities to combat cancer, respiratory disease, and a range of chronic illnesses and as well, and I find this so important, to create vaccines to prevent disease in the first place. Research that generates new medicines and vaccines can also literally save thousands of lives during pandemics or outbreaks. You may well know this, but it was a Canadian lab that developed the vaccine that provided a key breakthrough in ending the most recent Ebola crisis in West Africa. I think I was supposed to press that one sooner. I'm not really used to doing this myself, so <laughs> even though the folks did offer in your defense, but I thought I'd be better at it. All right, let's talk a little about it, the economic side of this, this industry. Uh, we do hear, as I mentioned earlier, a great deal about the price of pharmaceuticals. And while I'm, I'm not going to in, go into that in any great detail in this particular session, uh, it is an issue, and particularly when outlier and, frankly, non-member companies from this association undertake actions that are difficult for all of us to comprehend. Clearly, that's an issue that will benefit from much more dialogue. I was happy to learn, prior to signing on with Innovative Medicines Canada, that they do have a very stringent code of ethics which dictates members' actions. On the other side of the ledger from Price, the industry is proud to be a strong contributor to the funding of these important products. From drug discovery itself into your medicine cabinet, it takes about $2.6 billion of research and development spending to create an innovative medicine. It's one of the reasons. The pharmaceutical industry, in the end, uh, ends up being the source of almost all new medicines. And as you can see on this pie chart, 93% of the research is funded by industry, 3.5% by academia and nonprofit organizations, and 3.2% by governments. While I was with uh, the Canadian Cancer Society the last few years, I was always incredibly proud of being able to say that we contribute about $40 million every year to cancer research. And now I realize that it's, it's a bit of a drop in the bucket in terms of what it actually costs to get these drugs uh, uh, to, uh, to fruition. Other uh, facts that are emerging from some of the data analytics that, uh, that are being conducted literally as we speak, uh, members of Innovative Medicines Canada support over 30,000 jobs in Canada. And I was supposed to have a slide on this, but uh, yes, there we do. Oh, the data went up since the slide was, <laughs> was created, because I just said 30,000, which it is, 27,000. In addition, we invest more than $14.5 billion every year just in Canada alone. Uh, into the research and development activities. And overall, research and development and, uh, and other investments account for, yes, 11.3% of our members' revenues. And this is a, a conservative number. We are literally in the middle of a precedent-setting uh, data analytics project, which is assessing the economic footprint of the industry so we can better understand it. As you might imagine, it's a very competitive industry. These data are not typically available, but through a trusted third party, Ernst Young, we were able to get a better sense of what's happening. So the data is still coming in, but as of today, we have about 80% of it, and uh, we're at 10%. So in addition to uh, this investment from the companies I represent, uh, Innovative Medicines Canada founded in 1964 a foundation, the Health Research Foundation. The investments to date, and we do this in collaboration with uh, Canadian Institutes of Health Research, CIHR, uh, we've uh, funded about $30 million uh, to more than 1,700 researchers across the country. We also um, work, uh, oh, there's the foundation, 
There we are. We work with uh, patient organizations and health charities. And for the last several years, Innovative Medicines Canada staff has taken part in Prostate Cancer Canada's Plaid for Dad campaign. You may recognize me up there and certainly all of the Plaid. Send out lots of social media. All to say, uh, this is a side of the, uh, the industry that perhaps we don't hear about too much, but is as important as every other aspect that we tend to discuss. So I'll come back to this comment I made earlier about how do these drugs get from being a twinkle in a scientist's eye to actually being uh, something of benefit to you and to me, to the patient. This process is complex, not very well understood. I am still learning the nuances myself, to be honest. There are perhaps people in the room who know it better than I do. All it takes is one molecule to create a new medicine or a new vaccine. It sounds simple, and sometimes, frankly, it can be. But generally, it's a very complex process. It takes between 10 to 15 years to get a new medicine to patients. During preclinical research, pharmaceutical researchers isolate between 5 and 10,000 compounds for potential new medicines. They then select only about 250 to go to testing and on to a next phase. And that, that stage alone can take three to six years to complete. In the second phase, researchers further narrow the selection for in-depth clinical investigation. And once that investigation is complete, they can move to clinical trials, which you heard about already this morning and perhaps are involved in yourself. All of this to say, however, very few products do make it to clinical trials themselves. That being said, one of the areas that Canada excels in is clinical trials. I was surprised to discover that currently there are approximately 4,500 clinical trials going on in Canada alone. In fact, we should take pride in knowing that Canada is a leading country in terms of clinical trials, second only to the United States. Canada is globally recognized for the depth of expertise of its research clinicians. And as I get to know my members, I understand how much more they would like to invest in Canada in terms of clinical trials because of the research quality and the openness, I believe, to us to be involved with them. We have an extensive network of academic health institutions and research centers as well. They're available to support these clinical trials. 16 medical schools, over 45 academic healthcare organizations, and approximately 13,600 researchers. So clinical trials themselves really do form a most important part of this drug approval process. It's a step that requires significant investment on the part of the drug developer over a period that could last as long as five to seven years. Now, if that doesn't confuse you, probably nothing will, but let's walk through it a little bit more simply. In phase one of a clinical trial, the researchers test an experimental medicine typically on a small group of healthy people for the first time. The objectives here are to assess the medicine safety, find out what a safe range would be for dosage, and identify the side effects. In phase two, whoops, we want to go back, I think. We'll stay there. In phase two, the medicine is given to a larger group of people, usually about 100 individuals or more. And the purpose there is just to gather more data, be more clear on the safety of the product and what it's going to do. In phase three, the medicine is given to a larger group, usually up to about 1,000 people. Obviously, the objectives are always to confirm efficacy, monitor side effects, and collect information that will ensure the medicine can be used safely. The entire process takes thousands of volunteers, scientists, doctors, and researchers. And of course, and here's the crux, there's no guarantee of success. When clinical trials don't show promise, the researchers have to go back to the drawing board. In phase four, more research is done after the medicine is approved. This was a learning for me, so even though it may be approved, the research continues. And even after the clinical trials are fully complete, researchers continue to gather information on the best way to use a medicine, as well as the long-term benefits and risks. If clinical trials prove that a medicine's benefits outweigh the risks, the company applies to Health Canada for market authorization. Um, 
Yeah, this is a nice depiction, actually, of the geographic presentation of all of the, uh, the clinical trials taking place in Canada. Oh, I guess I should have done this along the way. My apologies. There we go. Phase one, two, three, and phase four. This is the fun one. So for every new drug that comes out, Health Canada then steps in. Once the company is, is prepared to bring a drug forward, feels very confident that this is a safe, efficacious drug. Health Canada, on behalf of all of us, has that accountability to make sure that the drug is safe, it's, it's efficacious, that there's good quality information developed during the clinical trials. This is usually about a year-long process. It examines tens of thousands of pages of data from the, the developer. Once this is completed, the company negotiates with each jurisdiction's drug programs. That means every individual province before the drug is reimbursed for a patient. After a new drug receives marketing approval from Health Canada, drug manufacturers will typically submit dossiers to public payers and to private insurers to obtain reimbursement for their product. It is, whether we like it or not, a business line. It's a private sector business. Ultimately then, though, each province makes its own decision as to whether or not it's going to fund a new medication. But they do receive advice from some central agencies, which I'll speak to in a moment. But it does explain to a great extent why we often hear the phrase about uh, health care by postal code, why Cana as Canadians we receive different care, different medications in different provinces, because it is uniquely up to the provinces to decide which medications they are going to fund. The Canadian Agency for Drug and uh, Technologies in Health, CADETH, reviews the cost effectiveness of a new medicine and makes reimbursement uh, recommendations to the jurisdictions. So this is done using a common drug review for non-cancer drugs, and then there's a special review, PCODER, Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review, for cancer drugs themselves. After there's, are you getting, are you still with me here? <laughs> Do we need to stand up and get fresh air? After there's a cost effectiveness recommendation, the, um, the Pan-Canadian Purchasing Alliance, PCPA, decides whether or not to attempt to negotiate a purchasing arrangement on behalf of participating jurisdictions. This has been a great development in Canada, although it adds another layer, because it means that our governments, who pay a lot of our health insurance, are getting the best prices possible, and the companies that develop the drugs get some predictability of the revenue they're going to get in. It, I think, works for everybody. And once through their process, the provinces may still not decide to reimburse the drug. It's a long process. And in fact, on average, it takes about 449 days, so you know that I'm, we've done the research on this, uh, in a public drug plan after it's been approved by Health Canada. So unfortunately, we find in a comparative study that Canada ranks 15th out of 20 countries in this regard. So there's no finger pointing here about this process, as all of us involved want safe, effective and affordable drugs to reach all Canadians, our own families. But there are many challenges to the current system and it requires collaboration to overcome. I do believe strongly, I'm sure you do, Canadians deserve the best that we can offer and we don't have the best just yet in this regard. To give you an idea of what's at stake in terms of timing, a 2014 report from the Manhattan Institute, so this is a U.S. study, it found that speeding up FDA approval by one year, and consider we've talked about multiple years, if we can look at our processes, speed it up by one year for a single generation of medicines, that would deliver $4 trillion in value to patients through longer life expectancy. Another study found that the adoption of a pharmaceutical innovation in cancer between 1995 and 2012 had a direct impact on reducing hospital care utilization by 23%, even though cancer diagnoses increased by 46% over that time frame. The savings generated to hospital care as a result of pharmaceutical innovation was estimated at $0.9 billion in 2012. These life quality and life expectancy gains are incredible to contemplate, particularly given that health spending in Canada currently consumes, we all know, about 45% of provincial budgets and is forecast to increase between 
uh, it increased to between 70 and 80 percent of provincial spending by 2025. These project projections don't account for anticipated efforts to tackle the ongoing challenge for vulnerable, vulnerable Canadians who struggle to obtain access to innovative medicines. It's really unclear, and I don't know if you're aware of this, um, hopefully you are, but uh, we don't know how many Canadians do not have access to either public or private insurance coverage, or maybe partially insured and not sufficiently. There's currently no up-to-date research, either by government or by the industry. It's a real gap. So we've, uh, we have undertaken a study with the Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association and in partnership with the Conference Board of Canada and Nanos Research uh, to better understand how many Canadians, first of all, are uninsured or underinsured. We hope to have the results of this work by the end of the fall and we'll be sharing the results with our partners, including governments. Final piece, perhaps, in terms of what our member companies are trying to do are the compassionate access programs, which you may well know about. And this is uh, particularly for those who are unable to access the medicines they need through either privately or publicly funded coverage. Between 2010 and 2014, I have the data for those years, Innovative Medicines Canada provided more than $770 million in free product donations by, uh, by its companies under these programs. So new medicines can offer benefits to the health system itself. Offsetting costs by reducing ER visits, eliminating the need for surgeries or other costly procedures, and allowing individuals to better manage chronic disease. When recognizing that sustainability of our health system is critical, the value calculation of any element, including pharmaceuticals or robotics, will benefit from a deeper and a broader assessment than price alone and include the value of global investment, of high-skilled jobs, a healthier and a more productive population. This is particularly true with the rise of breakthrough medicines. And I mentioned earlier about Hep C, that certainly very expensive in the short term, the value to patients is incalculable and far cheaper and more effective than years of enzyme therapy and liver transplants. There's an interesting example we've come across uh, of a recently developed gene therapy for a severe combined immune deficiency, better known as bubble boy disease. You might have heard about it. This young boy who was forced to live literally in a plastic bubble. This rare and deadly condition leaves children unable to protect themselves against infection. But in a small clinical trial with a new drug, 100% of patients remain alive three years later. Now the cost is high, 665,000 for a single dose. But it cures the condition. Italy was the first country to embrace a pay for performance model. That is, you pay after the drug has shown its impact. And they did that to alleviate intense budgetary pressures. Uh, they nevertheless agreed to cover the cost of this therapy. And the reason is that the upfront costs of the treatment are considerably less, less compared to the alternative current standard of care, which is estimated to cost $4 million over the course of just a decade of the life of one of these individuals. So let me wrap up with a few comments about partnership. Let me see if I've forgotten any of my slides. Here we are, vulnerable, we'll get to that again. So innovation-driven research that leads to new medicines helps Canada keep its publicly funded universal healthcare system strong. It creates new economy jobs and sustains startups and companies that are major contributors to our prosperity. And I had the good fortune to sit uh, with uh, Tercera, and I'm sure, sorry, I know I have your card and I forget your name, we'll get it again. Uh, but to understand that this is a new company just since May, uh, less than a dozen employees, but with a drug, they're here sponsoring this conference. That's the sort of thing that we need to cultivate and, and nurture in this country. It, uh, it also gives us a culture, this culture of discovery and improvement that's critical to meeting all of our medical challenges, as I mentioned earlier. We can't sit back and just let the solutions come to us. I hope that we'll use this raw talent that we've been speaking about, that you saw on evidence here this morning. We've got centers of research uh, excellence, and we do have this brave Canadian spirit of entrepreneurism. Uh, we need to use all of this to make Canadians more healthy. 
the solution to this vibrant culture of pharmaceutical in innovation that ensures all Canadians have access to the medicines they need faster, more safely, more smoothly than ever is in front of us. We need to provide support for vulnerable Canadians. We need to improve patient outcomes. We need to develop global best practices in the areas, as we mentioned earlier, ethics, market access, regulation, and also to help scale homegrown innovation to discover new drugs to help Canadians live healthier and longer lives. So as an industry, we do believe that there, these are all areas where we can work together. Government, stakeholders, the Prostate Cancer Network, we can leverage these collective resources to build a better and more innovative and sustainable healthcare system for the future. I, I've been reading these notes and it's not my comfort level as you may have gathered. I much prefer to speak to people and, and uh, there were so many stats and pieces of data points I felt that I needed to do that. But let me just say from the, the heart of how, uh, how deeply I feel uh, about this new role that I found myself in in this industry. And I know that there are challenges and tensions as I've referred to. But the, the hope and inspiration that I mentioned at the beginning and that I will conclude with is what really drives me on a daily basis to learn more, to find ways to build new bridges, to build new partnerships, and make sure that all of us are at the right tables to bring all of the pieces together and come up with the solutions that we all need as Canadians, whether it's prostate cancer or any of the other conditions that we ourselves suffer from, that we know friends who are dealing with, uh, it should be a driving force for all of us. We can all do better, and that's what I hope to contribute to. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll look forward to taking any questions. My name is Harry Splett from Bell's Corners, and I've noticed that from time to time drugs are taken off the market either in Canada, in the U.S., or in Britain. How is it that a drug can get through this very secure system that we seem to have and still do harm? I wish there was an easy answer to that question, and uh, there, as I said earlier, there may be others in this room that do, do have an answer. Uh, I guess I would offer that no system is perfect. Uh, as I mentioned in my comments, research continues even after all of the structures, the bodies that we have in place have deemed this efficacious, that new research comes to light, and thankfully, I would say, if that does happen, the powers that be do pull drugs off the market. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's planned. I don't think it's through thoughtless processes. It's just the, the way of the world. So I don't have a better answer for you than that. Um, you know, there, if you, you know, specific cases, there may be some specific reasons behind uh, those individual drugs. But in general, I would say that uh, we have the most safe process that we could possibly ask for, as uh, do the, most of the other countries that we deal with in the world. Um, but it's not perfect. Uh, there's another issue that I might put on the table, that there are a lot of us who, uh, and again, I don't believe that this influenced decisions, but we would be far more concerned if drugs that, were, uh, that had the potential to be effective were withheld for another decade and costing many more lives because the research wasn't perfect. So it's a bit of a balancing act. You're welcome. Angela Lassard from Sudbury. Hi, Angela. And uh, I just uh, this could be part of the question the previous gentleman asked. If it takes about 10 to 15 years from lab to patient here in Canada, and there are drugs that are accepted into Canada from other countries, what research do does Canada do? in finding out the research that these other countries 
and bringing out a drug in their market bring to Canada? So at this point, we actually replicate the processes. Uh, if a drug has been approved, for instance, by the FDA in the States, the EMA in Europe, um, that's, that's part of our research database, and I'm really speaking on behalf of all the agencies who do this, and I shouldn't do that, but, but let me attempt a bit of an answer. So once it comes to Canada, we still go through all of the steps that I outlined in my presentation and you saw on the slides to make sure that it's safe for Canadians. I would frankly argue that is something we need to look at uh, if we're wanting to shorten up the timelines a little bit. If we have trusted partners in other parts of the world who are doing the research, could we not look at that research and accept that as good enough for us too? Uh, you'd want to do some steps, of course, and that's a bit of a blanket statement, but I think as we, as partners, explore what we should be doing in this country, that is one of the pieces that I, I believe that we should take a look at. Yeah. You're welcome. You mentioned, oh, sorry, I should introduce myself, Debbie Olszewski. You mentioned the cost to develop medicines and research medicines, but I don't hear about the profits. Why are these never disclosed? What's coming in? We just hear that this costs and this costs and no. this costs. Uh, well, I'm not sure what exactly the, the question is that you're asking. I don't have a, yeah, maybe if you can keep the mic there, we have a bit of an exchange. Well, the, okay, I, I hear you mention that this yeah. percentage goes mm -hmm. to research and development, yeah. okay, and th there's this many employees, all right, so I understand, yeah. Yeah. but how much is coming in? Yeah. Obviously, so, there's a lot of drugs yeah. being sold and a lot of money's yeah. coming in. The like, what are the profits here? The details, so this is a, a, an industry, you're talking about private sector, and the arrangements, the, the negotiations that are made between each of the companies, I don't have anything to do with that, I, so I, can't, I can speak about process, but not the specifics. So the negotiations happen between uh, the payers and the companies individually as a private sector, and, a very, and there are anti-competition laws, in fact, the government agree, uh, that govern a great deal of what they do. So the, the deals, if you will, are worked out very directly between either federal or provincial governments uh, and the industry, or private payers. Those are not disclosed publicly. I can't speak to that. I know that it's a big question, which is why I reference it. I put it right out there. I'm aware there's a tension. I don't even know what those are. I'm a representative of an association body. The, the, sorry, you look like you want to jump in. <laughs> yeah. The government won't disclose that, but we all know where Walmart stands and Costco stands and the grocery store stands mm -hmm. and what the average coming in and going out, and yet yeah. drugs, we don't have a clue. And like another example, like the other thing that I wanted mm -hmm. just to mention quickly is, um, I don't know if you have control on this one, but. How is it that I can go to one pharmacy, I pay a $2 dispensing fee, down the street I pay $4, over here I pay 6 in my small little town I pay $13, I go to Costco and it's free, like, please explain it. Yeah, I was going to say go to Costco, which is where I would go, but, um, you know, one of the things I've learned is that there are different pieces of this sector, so I'm representing the patented um, medicine companies. You saw the slide at the beginning. The issue you're talking about is a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company, uh, drugstore company uh, issue. We have absolutely no say over that. Um, if I had one, Chander isn't here by any chance, is he? No, one of my colleagues here. So we do have some data where we've tried to look at the supply chain, which is what you're talking about, and I, I believe. And so you have multiple components of that. The price of the drug is, is here, and there are then distributors that um, add another cost onto it, so to get it from the manufacturing company to wherever it's going. And then there is a, uh, a dispensing fee from the pharmacists themselves and a pharmacy uh, portion of that. So there are at least four components that add prices to the drug along the way. Um, so I can't answer your question as to why there is a discrepancy at all, but I can give you the information about there is a national body that, that uh, speaks on behalf of uh, pharmacies, and I could make sure you get that information and you could ask them. 
So I don't really know what the, it's not in, in my bailiwick, unfortunately. But I will note it, and um, I'm kind of curious myself. I've just sort of uh, gone to Costco and avoided the question that way, I guess. I'm very fortunate I don't use, have to use drugs, so. But thank you for the questions. <laughs>